Hi, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I invite you to check out over 4,000 of my written reviews. I've been doing film reviews since 1996, and you can read all of them at my website, Quipster.net. Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to check out the link to my other podcast, similar to this one, maybe not as much background information and trivia because these are more recent movies that you can find in theaters, VOD, streaming services, what have you. And you can find the link to that at my website. It's called the Quipster Film Review Podcast at Quipster.net. Today, I'm going to be getting into the third of this three-part series looking at alien refugees to Earth. Folks from outer space who've come to Earth for safety and maybe for a place to live permanently, at least in this case, Stranded was just a temporary situation. Today I'm going to be talking about 1988's Alien Nation. This is an R-rated film. It does have strong violence, brief nudity, drug content, and language. The runtime is a relatively short hour and 31 minutes. James Caan and Mandy Patinkin are the main stars. Terrence Stamp gets a sizable supporting role. Graham Baker is the director and the screenplay credited to Rockney S. O'Bannon. Now, the seeds of alienation, they started way back in 1985 when a producer named Richard Kobritz was looking for a writer for this other project that he had in mind. It was a horror project that he was going to do after the success of Christine, and it involved a killer doll, and it was going to be made for Columbia Pictures. It was going to be called Mechanicals at that time. Eventually, Kobritz hired Rockney S. O'Bannon for that project. O'Bannon was on hiatus. He was writing and story editing for the eerie TV anthology revival of The Twilight Zone. He also did an episode of Amazing Stories during this time in the mid-1980s. If you recognize O'Bannon's name, he created Farscape many years later in 1999 for the Sci-Fi Channel. Now, when the Columbia Project went into turnaround, the two men decided that they were going to collaborate on another project that they could work on. And O'Bannon already had an idea that he had been pitching to a a few studios for a new television series. He thought that that premise could also work as a movie if they wanted to make one. It was a police procedural with a science fiction twist, a buddy cop action flick partnering a human and an alien out on patrol in the city. Kobritz gave O'Bannon two and a half months to write a script on spec instead of making a studio pitch. Cop films were very hot in the 1980s, so O'Bannon developed this project as a cop flick primarily, although with that science fiction underpinning. It would stay grounded on Earth. There was going to be no space flights, no alien tech or laser blasts or flying cars. The aliens could not return to their homeworld and because they were slaves there. If, to keep costs low, the setting was the very, very near future with the crash of an alien spaceship carrying these aliens called newcomers. And to make this story work, the aliens excelled at assimilation into human culture. They were very fast at picking up how to live among humans. They quickly learned to speak Earth's languages fluently, and they would adapt to Earth's clothing and culture pretty much looking like humans except for certain features. O'Bannon's first script carried the title of Future Tense because it was set in the immediate future and it was meant to be a tense thriller. As he wrote, he had Patrick Swayze in mind for the jaded human cop, and then his sidekick would be perhaps John Candy in the role of his alien partner. Once completed, Kobritz submitted this script to all of the studios. Several did express some interest, but Kobritz decided to go with Pacific Western Productions, and that was run by his friend, Gail Ann Hurd, who had a development deal with 20th Century Fox at that time. Now, Hurd, when she read this script, she really couldn't stop. It was really a page-turner. She loved the immigration allegory within this science fiction action flick formula. Heard brought it immediately to Fox, and they loved it as well, except for the title, which they really couldn't decipher, and they felt audiences would not really understand what that was about either, future tense. Kobritz and Obana decided they would brainstorm very quickly a new title, because essentially it was in the heat of the night, except with an alien instead of a black man, and it was also like it was an episode of The Outer Limits, so they decided to combine the two into a new title called Outer Heat. 
Now, based on the strength of his popular Isuzu commercials, the ones in the mid-1980s that were very popular, it was called the Liar series. It starred David Leisure as Joe Isuzu. Heard and Kobritz selected the director of those commercials from Great Britain, Graham Baker. He was hired really to keep control of this production. He was not necessarily hired to bring a brand new vision from what they wanted. Baker had been a director as well in feature films. He did the third film in the Omen franchise called The Final Conflict, which came out in the early 1980s. A couple years later, he did a a horror flick called Impulse. And Baker, when he read the script, he knew he wanted to do it within five or six pages into reading it. And he felt like, just like they had mentioned, in the heat of the night, but with the relationship between a different planetary species that initially doesn't like one another, similar to Enemy Mine in that respect, a film that he very much enjoyed. Now, immediately they knew that they needed to start right away with trying to develop the look of these aliens. Heard went to a familiar collaborator. He had worked on The Terminator and the Aliens, Stan Winston, for those makeup duties. But Winston was busy directing Pumpkinhead at the time, so he could not be directly involved. But he felt his top-notch crew could handle the foam latex process to bring these aliens to life, somewhat similar to Planet of the Apes. O'Bannon's script described the aliens as being all over six feet tall. They would have leathery skin. Those early designs that Winston's crew came up with resembled hulking brutes to contrast their gentle personality. But Baker and Hurd urged for subtlety. They wanted to make these alien characters as human-like as possible, maybe more like a different ethnicity than a frighteningly eerie new species. And that's because Baker wanted audiences to recognize each actor under these prosthetics and to instantly accept this premise and these characters rather than continuously view them as aliens or something that could never really assimilate with human society. During this period, Heard showed the screenplay to her then-husband and frequent collaborator, James Cameron. Cameron decided he was going to do some script doctoring here. He revised the script in October of 1987. He removed this opening narration that O'Bannon had put into it. He made the action sequences within the story service the plot rather than just be side detractions from it. And when Cameron was done, Heard gave the revised script back to O'Bannon to make a final revision to this Cameron polish getting outer heat into its final state. And one last change was asked for by Fox. Again, they didn't like the title yet again, Outer Heat. And that was because there were a couple of other high-profile mismatched cop films that were set for an early summer 1988 release with Heat in the title, Red Heat with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dead Heat with Joe Piscopo. So they wanted to avoid confusion, so they opted to change the title from Outer Heat to Alien Nation. All as one word, Alien Nation with no space, and that was because it was a play on the word, of course, alienation. But then they decided for marketing purposes, Alien Space Nation was a much better choice. Alien Nation is set in Los Angeles in the presumptive 1991. That was three years after this film came out, three years after a malfunctioning spaceship landed in the Mojave Desert, containing 300,000 of these new immigrants to Earth. These aliens are the new boat people, dubbed newcomers. They were genetically engineered as slave laborers on their own planet. They were bred to adapt and assimilate quickly to any new environment. And these newcomers are smarter. They're physically stronger than their human counterparts. And that makes them much more suitable to perform a variety of different jobs. The backlash against these newcomers from the human population escalates daily. The newcomers are different in humans in a few key ways. They're hairless. They do have two hearts. They get drunk, not off of alcohol, but spoiled milk. They eat raw meat. Seawater is like battery acid to them. Now, James Conn, he plays an LAPD detective named Matt Sykes. Sykes' partner gets killed by one of these slags. That's the derogatory term humans use for newcomers. So Sykes makes it his mission to take down the baddies who are responsible. He volunteers to be partnered with the first newcomer ever promoted to be a police detective, a man named Samuel Francisco. Yes, Sam Francisco. He's named that because the immigration officials grew mischievous trying to think of Earth names or maybe bored for these newcomers. Sykes calls him George instead, and that's kind of a a nod because in the original script that was written by Rock O'Bannon, 
That character was supposed to be named George Jetson, but very shortly before they started to shoot film, Hanna-Barbera came to them and said that they were not going to allow them to use the name. So they came up with San Francisco very quickly. Now, while Sykes and Francisco are not assigned to the homicide case directly, Sykes really doesn't want to stay off of it. So he employs Sam's help to investigate the slag drug syndicate that's pushing this narcotic that's turning even docile newcomers into nearly unstoppable beasts. Now, for the lead role of Sykes, Baker sought James Kahn. Kahn had just come out of retirement. He was looking for a well-paying role in films. Kahn had a reputation for being feisty, but Baker stuck to his gut. He really wanted James Kahn. He was a big admirer of his work. So Kahn signed on to this formula action thriller with this science fiction premise. And that was like after a period of about six years where he didn't do any films. He burnt out in 1981 following the death of his sister to leukemia and his own battle with cocaine addiction. And he decided to clear his head. He spent time with his young son, Scott. He really was enjoying his life away from Hollywood. The only thing that brought him back was this 1987 film by Francis Ford Coppola called Gardens of Stone, which failed to get much recognition in the box office, although he did get some acclaim for his performance here. Khan had run out of money. He was risking losing his house, so he decided he had to go back to work. He needed a bigger payday here, and this was a lucrative offer. So Khan agreed to alienation to show that he could also open a picture. He still had box office appeal, especially since this was a film that he thought his son, Scott, might enjoy. So he signed on without even reading the script. He didn't even know the full story, but... He thought that the director was friendly, Graham Baker, and he wanted to work with Mandy Patinkin, who had already signed on. So he said yes, and he prayed for the best for what would be, hopefully, a good film. Now, once he found out what the movie was actually about, he instantly thought it was B-movie formula. It was pretty easy to figure out from the script. He especially did not like when Terrence Stamp, the bad guy, enters the scene. He thought that everybody was going to know what happens there. He felt that many aspects of the script did not make very much sense, and that and when he brought suggestions to Baker, Baker really wasn't interested in hearing him. He was really there to just deliver what the producers wanted. So Khan decided he was just going to go with the flow. He would, again, pray for the best, that a good outcome would result. When Khan read the script, he had intended to play his character as an all-out racist, one who would put Archie Bunker to shame. But when they hired a black actor as his very first partner, the one that gets killed and he vows to avenge, he realizes that all-out racist was not really going to fly. And when he voiced his displeasure at this, he realized that in this film, he was just an actor. He was just trying to get through a movie. It didn't always make sense. He was just going to do the best he can with his individual role and not pay attention to what everybody was doing around him. So he was going to play Sykes instead as this narrow-minded, bigoted jerk that doesn't want to accept change until those changes are out of his control and it becomes his new normal. At the very least, he is proud of the character work that he did, especially with Mandy Patinkin, for the buddy cop scenes. Now, Batinkin had a much harder role because he spent the first four hours every day in the makeup chair for these prosthetic headpieces that he had to wear pretty much all night for the shoot. And they also decided to allow more freedom for these actors in makeup. They learned from the mistake in Enemy Mine. In Enemy Mine, Lou Gossett Jr. appears pretty much unrecognizable in his performance under this mask and this thick alien accent. So they wanted this to be just another race of immigrants in the United States, but just slightly not human. Patinkin did hate the makeup process all four hours every single day, especially the base of the makeup, the tight bald cap that gave him headaches. But he was committed to the part and he wanted to do the best job he can. Patinkin said that the only thing that got him through this whole experience was that James Kahn had a great sense of humor and they enjoyed their working together. Now, Kahn's role may be not as difficult as Patinkin's, but he did have a hard time trying to play this bigot that we're supposed to find likable enough to root for, even though we are supposed to also not like him. There's a story arc there that we're supposed to root him on. You know, that conversion has to be from beginning to end believable, which is not easy to do in a 90-minute film that has a lot of extended 
action sequences. Manny Patinkin took the part, really, because his agent thought it would be a good picture and great exposure for him. He also liked the anti-drug and anti-bigotry message underneath. He thought the script actually had a lot of promise. If they could put all the pieces together, it could be a worthwhile film. And Patinkin really did go all out. He, the first two weeks before he started shooting the film, he started training with the New York Police Department to get into his character. He joined them on ride-alongs. He wanted to get the feel for the weaponry. He went to the firing range and shot a, a host of different weaponry in order to prepare for his part. Alienation, I think, it plays better as this uncanny science fiction film rather than a straightforward actioner, but the filmmakers do emphasize the latter. They jettison the allegorical qualities for a very prolonged climax that's not really nearly as satisfying. You know, it is kind of a formula buddy cop film, but it's also derivative of other 1980s science fiction films, Blade Runner and The Terminator most notably. It offers a strong action chase element at its core, while it also delivers something to think about thematically underneath. Because they had worked so well together, Heard hired Terminator cinematographer Adam Greenberg because he specialized in location night shoots. Although Bannon's script emphasized a bright and sunny Los Angeles during the daytime, Heard wanted to have a grittier take shot during the evening, not only because this was kind of a noirish crime story, but she also needed to work days on another project she was doing at the same time, a horror flick called Bad Dreams. The Greenberg shot with an eye toward authenticity. Although it's a fantastical science fiction premise, he wanted real lighting, he wanted real location shooting, he emphasized the dark and gritty streets around Los Angeles. So he worked with production designer Jack Collis, who collaborated with Baker on Impulse, and they sought practical exteriors as well as interiors, although there were a small number of impractical scenes done in the studio, such as those involving stunts and any kind of work in the water. Harsh lighting. Normally, that's a no-no for films featuring prosthetics. You're under these hot lamps, and things didn't really work out well. That became the goal for Greenberg. He wanted to make these prosthetics work in the harshest light imaginable. So he worked very closely for several weeks with Stan Winston's makeup crew to come up with just the right look and just the right prosthetics that would work under these lamps. He would shoot the actors that he wanted those head masks to be on, but he didn't want us to see the seams around the eyes or the necks. So that required a lot of tinkering with the right angles for the cameras as well as the lighting. So these headpieces would look natural without breaking the flow of the shot. Portions of Los Angeles were dressed up as Slagtown. That's the name for the rundown community where the newcomers reside. Signage and graffiti and shop fronts and various sounds were injected to resemble immigrant communities that similarly hold sections of major cities, you know, Chinatown, Koreatown, etc. Zoltan Elik, he had just won an Academy Award for the makeup work that he had done on Mask. He also was known for doing the look for Max Headroom on television. He came on board at Stan Winston's recommendation. Elick and Winston had just worked together on The Monster Squad. So Elick was brought in to take charge of the prosthetics for the newcomers based on Stan Winston Studios' designs. Now, Patinkin was not the only one who despised the makeup process. Terrence Stamp really, really hated the makeup. He nearly quit mid-production because of overwhelming feelings of claustrophobia at all times. Stamp claimed he was not told from the beginning that the makeup was going to take hours to apply and wear every day. So to accommodate Stamp's phobia and his hard feelings, they got him in makeup as soon as he arrived on the set and they shot his scenes first so that he'd be out of that makeup sooner. And when it came time for Stamp to wear the specially fitted bodysuit to play this cracked out Harcourt, which is his character, for the finale, he absolutely refused. He claimed his skin was in constant irritation and he was in constant pain from all of this makeup. He was not going to expose more of his body to it. So Stamp's stunt double, a man named Terry Jackson, he performed in Stamp's stead for that finale, despite having very little facial resemblance. Now, as far as the wardrobe goes, not very much went into it per se, but Sykes, uh, James Conn's character, he wears a Dallas Cowboys t-shirt. He wears it so often, really, he's wearing the same shirt every day. That was Conn's choice, by the way. He had friends on the Dallas Cowboys team, so this was kind of a, a wink and a nod to them. You may even confuse James Conn for Jerry Jones. They have a, a very similar look to them. Now, because of that t-shirt, the NFL sent Fox a bill for $50,000 about a week into the shoot for copyright infringement. 
Fox decided to pay it and let Khan wear the T-shirt because it was less costly to give NFL Properties $50,000 than to reshoot that whole week of footage. Now, there are production stills that do exist, and as well as elements in the trailer that depict scenes that did not make the final cut, especially from the climax. One involves the character named Rudyard Kipling, one of the henchmen of Harcourt, attacking Sykes, and then he gets shot by Francisco in the film. That re-edit meant that the score that had been done for the film by Jerry Goldsmith, it was a very synthy score that was kind of deemed too strange by the producers to be used, but they decided to jettison it altogether, not only because they found the score very weird from the get-go, but also because Jerry Goldsmith by that point was unavailable to rescore the film. So they decided to go with an entirely new score by composer Kurt Sobel. Now, obviously, Jerry Goldsmith is a, a much bigger name and he has a bigger fan base. So if you're interested in hearing the Goldsmith score that he did for Alienation, you can hear a little bit in the original trailer, but it was also released many years later on this limited edition CD. And if you listen to that CD release, it contains a melody motif that Goldsmith had intended for Oliver Stone's Wall Street, which he resigned from because he had many clashes with Oliver Stone. So he was going to reuse that recurring melody for Alienation, a completely different kind of movie, which is probably why the producers found it very weird. But when they cut that score out, Goldsmith resurrected it again for another film called The Russia House, came out in 1990. That was the uh, Sean Connery film. Very much a drama, so interestingly, that score had multiple uses for multiple genres. Now, although James Conn proved a fun collaborator on the set, at least for Patinkin, Khan does consider Alienation to be a very silly film. He rarely cares to discuss it. However, he did enjoy working with Patinkin as well. And although Khan initially liked director Graham Baker when he first met him, Khan's reputation for feistiness did emerge. They butted heads regularly throughout the shoot. And Khan lost all respect for Baker. He thought Baker caved too quickly to the studio demands. And during an interview with the Dallas Times Herald after its release, Khan told them that he was not crazy about this film, to be quite frank, and there were a lot of mistakes that were made, especially in the ending. And he went on to say that Baker really could not direct traffic, so he really doesn't have a lot of good things to say, so he tries not to say them at all these days. Now, upon release, Alienation did do relatively well. It debuted at number one at the box office in early October, and it lingered in the top five for about another month. And all told, it took in about, in the United States, it took in about $25 million and about $25 million. It had a $16 million budget. So with international money added in, it made about 32 or $33 million. So it made some money. And it also won the Saturn Award for Best Science Fiction Film of 1988. So it got some respect from the sci-fi film heads. Alienation, it is an entertaining science fiction premise. It's mixed with that cop thriller. It offers enough interesting background information and that cop buddy movie repartee to please fans of both genres. Underneath the narrative, there is that commentary on immigration, especially the difficulty of assimilation into current culture, as well as this uneven class system that's created by bigotry and xenophobia that leaves outsiders to fend for themselves. They turn to crime, to drugs, and any other means to make money. It never really delves deeply into those themes because this is a film that plays more as a straightforward action movie primarily, but future efforts on television. Yes, it became a television show after the film's release and quite a few novels as well. Those developed more on those themes in greater detail and that made it much stronger, a bigger fan base, more unique science fiction work than was developed just from the film itself. But because of the many alterations, the original screenwriter and the conceiver of this story, Rockne O'Banning, he really could not bring himself to watch the movie when it was first out in release, but he did watch the movie years later and he found it oddly enjoyable despite not really living up to his expectations or at least his demands. Since then, O'Bannon decided he was going to take more control over any stories that he did. He directs a lot of his own. He produces a lot of his own stuff. He says that the TV series that came out after, which he was not really involved with, and some alienation made-for-TV movies, there were about five of them that were made, they explored his original vision with a lot more of that depth that he had wanted to put into this first film. So he really can't complain about the superficiality of the theatrical film because if you take into consideration the TV series, the made-for-TV movies, the novels, the comic books, etc., all of this went far beyond what he thought he was going to be able to cover. 
in the first movie, and so he was glad to see it. Although they eventually made it kind of a darkly gritty film, kind of like Mean Streets, but with some comedy, O'Bannon's original concept was that it should stay light and funny, primarily because we're supposed to laugh at the folly of the bigotry instead of grimly accept it. Another disagreement that O'Bannon had with the way that they made this film was in specifying the date of the film. O'Bannon wrote his story to take place at this undetermined time. In fact, the very first words you see on the screen are next February, so it could have perennial appeal. We weren't really told what the date was. However, Fox decided to set the film definitively in 1991, including emblazoning that date on the movie's poster, That may have worked for audiences in 1988, but it really handcuffed future projects because it doesn't make sense beyond that date because we know none of these events ever really happened in 1991 or really any years henceforth. Now, Alienation never really delves deep enough in its characters to truly make the climax as gripping as it needs to be to elevate it into a science fiction classic for all times, but it is a fun film, and the screenplay O'Bannon manages to rise above the B-movie delivery to make this a more intelligent and ethical story than most buddy cop thrillers around the takedown of a drug manufacturing crime lord tend to be. It's alien and yet oddly familiar, and it is an enjoyable film, It's a B-movie premise, but we like the characters. There are really good, strong character performances in this film. And it is enjoyable as very well-made B-movie fare. So that's why I'm going to give Alien Nation three stars out of four. Three stars on my scale means I do recommend it for people who like this kind of movie. If you like your buddy cop thrillers, especially if you like science fiction as well, I think you're going to get the mileage to enjoy Alien Nation quite a bit. And if you really like this premise and you feel that the film did not explore it, there is the television series as well as those made-for-TV movies and those novels and comic books you can delve into as well. And by the way, that TV series that came on, it was produced by Kenneth Johnson. And if you've seen the miniseries called V in the early to mid-1980s, he produced that TV show. So there's a lot of sci-fi cred for that TV show. It definitely has a fan base that still does exist. There are a lot of continuations that they've talked about. So definitely worth delving into if you get through this movie and you give it, like me, three stars or more out of four. In 2009, just the next year, there was another movie, very acclaimed movie and popular movie that came out called District 9 that captured many of the same themes of alienation, of immigration and assimilation using this alien species. So definitely another movie to check out if you like the thematic material at the very least of alienation. Also in 2009, the same year as District 9, the Sci-Fi Channel started to develop a remake of alienation with writer Tim Minear. Tim Minear, if you know American Horror Story, he's one of the writers for that show as well as an executive producer. Fox 21 was going to produce that remake and they were going to set it in the Pacific Northwest in the year 2020, this year of this recording that I'm doing right now. 20 years after the alien ship lands with the newcomers who multiplied to represent a population of three and a half million by that point, although they still mostly live segregated from living with the rest of humanity. Nothing really came of that. In 2015, Fox announced a remake in the work with Iron Man's Art Markham and Matt Holloway scripting. After they left, the project was then handed to Jeff Nichols. Nichols thought he could make a trilogy out of it if the first one was successful. And Nichols said it was not going to be a remake of the first film, but it was going to be an original story that he had in mind already. But he would use the same title because he thought that was a fantastic title. And he would use some of the themes here. And he wanted his favorite actor, Michael Shannon, to play the lead alien, but in 2019, Disney paused production on Jeff Nichols' version of Alien Nation three days after they had acquired 20th Century Fox, one of the many casualties from Fox that Disney was not so keen on. Nichols has contemplated, by the way, transferring the ideas he had for Alien Nation into another film, an unrelated project that would explore some of those themes he had in mind. We may not see Alien Nation, but some of those ideas will get recycled in a future Nichols effort, so he says. Now, in 2017, another movie that had a lot of the same idea of Alienation did come out. It was not Alienation, but it very much, for a lot of people, did resemble it. It came out on Netflix in 2017 with Will Smith, and it was called Bright. So I guess if you can't get enough, you can also check that one out. Alienation may not have an official remake, but it has been remade a number of times in a variety of other mediums and in other films altogether that use the same premise. 
If you have your own thoughts on Alien Nation that I did not cover, or if you just want to talk to me about your experience with this film, you can write to me. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Links to my Twitter feed, Facebook page, Instagram can all be found there as well. As far as what I'm going to be talking about next week, I mentioned it in the review here, at least toward the end. Not a movie, but a miniseries that covers some similar ground to Alienation in which we have basically refugees from another planet who come to Earth, but they are definitely not the same aliens as the newcomers here. The miniseries I'm talking about is the original one, V, from 1983. So you have two movies that you have to watch for next week. And if you haven't seen it, or if you haven't seen it in a long time, I do recommend you catch up with V, the miniseries, for the discussion on next episode. And I'm very much looking forward to that, something I have not seen since it first aired when I was 12 years old on television. Anyway, thank you so much for listening and joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. 